The last time on Building Resilience, we were taking a bird's eye view of the project scope and an ant's eye view of some demolition. So the project's overall scope involves taking the house from 1,700 square feet roughly to 3,500 square feet. It's gonna go from three bedrooms to six bedrooms and from one bathroom to four. We're tearing the stucco off the original house. We're gonna put up uh, Huber's Zip R12, which is an insulated sheeting. It's two inches of insulation, half inch OSB with an integrated weather resistant barrier over that. We're gonna be adding in a rain screen system. From Benjamin Update. So that it stays dry and breathes well. And then we're gonna be putting some three quarter inch cellular PVC panels from ASIC over the front, over all of that to give it a really contemporary look. We're gonna be replacing all of the windows in the house with triple pane windows from Marvin. Uh, and the triple glazing for both sound, insulation, and condensation resistance. And overall, the house is just gonna be a lot more livable, uh, a lot more durable, a lot more efficient. Ultimately, it's gonna be a pretty darn resilient house. With the old addition in the recycle bin and the recycle bin on the truck, it's time to get to work building the foundation. We like to turn the cameras on when people don't realize it because it gives us a little more reality in the show. Here we learn what a sand boulder is, wet sand that freezes. While they're convenient for holding down plastic, they can also heave a footing up and away from where you pour it. All right, uh, so um, the demo, obviously, we got the addition off of the back of the house. That's a good thing. Um, and we dug a giant pit, that's a good thing. And uh, we got footings and foundation and insulation and waterproofing and slip sheet all in. And um, now we're tenting over the foundation. This is because uh, it is cold outside and it's gonna get colder. We're gonna be sub-zero for a couple days. And um, Without a cap on here, the soils below would freeze and would wreak havoc on our, on our brand new foundation, which would be, uh, that would be no bueno. As you can see, um, it's a really nice playground style sand. It's very uh, consistent, uh, it's not too fine, uh, it's got fantastic drainage. It really, in many ways, serves the site incredibly well. But right now, as the temperature's dropping, we got some snow coming in. If we didn't cover the foundation, this stuff would get wet and freeze. And because the water gets into the, into the sand so quickly, it would freeze right around our footing, potentially under the footing, and soils will heave here. And that would just wreak havoc on the entire structure. Let's peel back the layers from this foundation and see what makes it warm, dry, and unlikely to heave from frost. CMU wall, commonly referred to as a foundation. Here's our damp proofing, our waterproofing. Bitumous product that gets adhered to the surface of the block, keeps it dry. Three inches of the pink stuff. We're having a baby, so in celebration of that, we decided we should go with the pink stuff this time. Plus, it's a good product. Three inches gives us R15. On the outside of the foundation. We'll talk about why that's so important at some other time. And then we have a slip sheet. And the slip sheet's something that a lot of folks evidently haven't seen. Uh, we hadn't seen them until recently in Minnesota when they became part of the code. The purpose of the slip sheet is to keep the soils, these soils, which when they're in the winter can, can freeze solid down about four feet, from bonding with the insulation, and as the soils move and heave in their freeze-thaw, potentially ripping the insulation off the foundation. They are a pain uh, to install. Uh, in sandy soils, we're lucky. The install goes fairly well. Uh, when we go to backfill, they don't get shredded. But in clay soils, where the soils are really heavy, um, this plastic oftentimes gets ripped pretty badly, and um, it gets ugly. But this is, this is what it's supposed to look like, and the theory behind it is solid. The theory behind it is great. It's just the, uh, the practical installation of them is a little tricky. 
This is our footer or our footing. It's uh, 10 inches thick, two feet wide. Our drain tile is on the outside of the structure. And this is the connection point here with all this. You see how the sand just fills itself right back in? It's a joy to work with. The uh, CMU wall has got wire reinforcement every other course, and then rebar every four feet, uh, which that is, and then is core filled. Uh, and then of course the top, it's like a bonding beam of sorts, uh, connects the whole thing together. And that's solid filled. So here at the original foundation, um, we drill into the old block work and pin this foundation to that foundation. This helps eliminate any difference in movement. The first couple years on a foundation, there can be some shifting. Um, soil type tends to drive that a little bit. We're not gonna see a lot of movement in sand um, of this quality, so things should be pretty stable. This is a 102 years old foundation. And while the Masons had a lot of commentary about, you know, what they don't think was the best block work, and their block work is pretty good. You know, I feel like uh, anything that that manages to go a century and look still this solid and stable without any cracks or defects, I think they did a fine job. Underneath our slabs, we have some critical elements. Um, the first is our capillary break. Our capillary break is gonna be comprised of rock. Um, it's gonna be half inch or larger in diameter. Uh, and that ensures that water can't wake up into the slab. Some people think that that sheet of plastic that goes underneath your slab is your capillary break. It is not. That's a vapor gas, soil gas, um, uh, a control layer. Minnesota is high risk for radon, so we always have plastic under our slabs. Um, the rock, however, is the capillary break. Um, the next piece that we do that's a little bit different, um, we have uh, some pink stuff, uh, and we put it at the edge of the slab. So this ensures that we've got a thermal break between our slab and our foundation wall. There's no reason for this concrete slab to be bonded, touching, connected uh, to our foundation wall. It's not a structural slab. Um, obviously there are always exceptions to that rule, but this is not one of them. Then over the top of the footing, we have two inches of insulation. And then across the entirety of the floor, we have three inches of insulation for R15. Now, <clears throat> why don't we have R15 here? Because on the opposite side of this wall, we already have R15. So we're really here, we're just looking to make sure that there's no thermal transfer through the footing itself here into the earth. And at this corner here, we're already R15 on the other side. So it's a very warm corner. We're not gonna see any of those conditions uh, where you have like weird condensing corners and stuff take place on the slab. It's a super simple detail. It works amazingly and, and the slab doesn't need in-floor heat to be warm because it's not losing so much heat to the ground and to the walls. Just heating this room, the slab will take on some of that heat, kind of like a giant radiator uh, and throw it back to you like a team ass type thing. So that's our floor. And we'll pour that floor after we frame a new one over the foundation and sheath it with Advantec subflooring, a resilient subfloor that stands up to the elements. Then we'll build some walls on top of that. Turns out there are three types of wall in this little addition. We'll use regular zip system sheathing, an exterior gypsum product for a very local reason, and we'll also use some zip system R12 insulated sheathing. On this wall, we've got our Zip R12 over two by four framing. We'll finish it out on the other side with our rain slicker. From and Benjamin Update. And then our ASIC three quarter PVC panel system on top of that. Make sure to tune in next time to Building Resilience.